Hi everyone, thank you guys for coming to Communities Workshop. We are a student-run organization who hopes to spread and educate everyone about quantum computing. So today we have Robert, um, he works at IBM and he has been working for the past 38 years, which is actually really <laughs> amazing. Um, so Robert, how about you get started with your presentation? I'd love to hear what you have to say. Okay, thank you. Well, you gotta work somewhere, so, you know. <laughs> That's the way it works. You wake up one day and lo and behold. All right, so um, we, uh, so I work for IBM, and uh, clearly, and so I, I do want to make clear at, at the, the beginning here that um, I can't speak for all the different people who are working on quantum computing, um, and so clearly, you know, primarily I'll be talking about our plans, our roadmaps, and things like that. But I'll try to make some observations along the way about um, what, what I think will come along and what must happen. Um, uh, in particular, um, I'd like you to think about as I go through this saying, well, okay, IBM may be doing this or IBM may be thinking about this, but what has to be happening in the industry anyway, right? So uh, what is the general flow of technology for quantum computing as we get closer and closer to applications that can show some advantage with this? Um, when you get above the level of saying, well, this qubit technology, that qubit technology, and so forth, and things like this. So, uh, so this concept of, of a roadmap is, is very important, and it's important for a lot of people. Um, if you are a developer, it's important because you're thinking, well, about your future. You're thinking about the types of skills that you have now what skills you're going to need. You're going to uh, be thinking about what jobs you're going to have. You should be thinking about what you'd like to do. As a software developer, there are many different things. And I'll highlight at least three classes of them. Um, so there, there's a lot about the skills in the future that are very important to software developers and, and students and future researchers and things like that. Um, if you are someone who is thinking of using quantum computing, so let's say you are, uh, a, a company, uh, a startup, you could be, uh, again, a research organization, you could be a government, anybody. Roadmaps are good because you can at least look at them to get an idea of how people hope the industry will flow. Now, uh, there's a, a very famous cartoon, and, and my brother gave me this on a poster years ago. Um, I'm a mathematician by training. And the point is, is that this, this is not a roadmap saying that something will happen in the future and won't, won't I be wonderful and amazing and world leading when you really do not have a clue how you're going to get from here to there. So there's a difference between a roadmap and many people are putting out very serious, um, you know, guideposts for, to, to, uh, that, that they'll be following. And, and people that it, it's really just a complete marketing exercise to say, you know, look at me, look at me, I'm wonderful, or, or I'm going to be wonderful. Right? So, so you have to look at all of these. And it, it's nice to have a roadmap, but you need to say, well, do these people really have confidence in this? Or, or do they believe they can really do it? Why do they believe they can do this, right? Because otherwise it's just, you know, you're putting things down with years next to them and maybe it'll happen and, and, and maybe it won't. Um, primarily, I'm going to uh, be talking about this and this is the so-called development roadmap that we published about three weeks ago. Um, it it complements a roadmap that we published in September around hardware. And I am going to quickly review that uh, because it, it relates to this. Um, at the bottom here, of course, is, is hardware. But I want to talk about certain aspects of that, and I think it will make clear as we start layering software uh, uh, above it. You know, software is is very interesting. I'm I'm as I said, I'm a math, I'm a software guy, computer science. Um, uh, I tend to think of the hardware as you know what is down there at the bottom level. Now it's incredibly sophisticated with an amazing amount of science and engineering that's part of that. But thinking from a software level, th th there are layers, right? There, there are people who work close to it and then you keep working up going higher and higher and higher um, to eventually people <laughs> almost wanna say here, just solve the problem, right? Just, just call some function, just call something and do it. I don't care. Um, the, you know, what people talk about with the cloud, with serverless is I don't care what machines you're going to use. 
please just just do it okay and then get back to me and send me the bill when i'm done so we will return to this but i will spend a certain amount of, of time building this and discussing the aspects of what comes first and and the various players uh, that are part of this now the reason why we do this all right just just to be very clear <laughs> i'm part of ibm research we've had five or six nobel prize winners associated uh with us we've had national medals of science but fundamentally we do not do science for science's sake okay and and that's important to remember we do science because ultimately we are a company right and we are driven by the computing requirements present and future of our clients, of our customers. So as part of this in 2017, we started um, what we call the IBM Quantum Network. It's now over 140 different institutions. Over the last few weeks, we've, we've welcomed a few new members such as BP in the, in the energy business. Uh, there's a brand new hub in Canada, for example, at, at Sherbrooke um, in Quebec. Um, and, and you can see there are many startups that are part of this and the amount of academic research and educational partners. So we're all in this together is the point, right? These are the people who have the problems that need to be solved. These are the people who set the requirements, right? These are the people who make us create better hardware and better software um, to make what they do better. Uh, in some cases, it may be very practical problems. Um, it, for example, uh, we just published a paper with ExxonMobil of, of routing of tankers in the oceans around the world, how to do that more efficiently, how to combine that with classical and quantum uh, techniques for optimization. Um, other people are in it because it's going to be their business, their startups, right? They themselves want to build quantum solutions that they will sell to clients and offer in, in different ways as well. So it's, it's driving um, usage. It will drive monetization in many different ways. It will drive education um, and, and so many different things. So that, that's why I really wanted to put this up in front because sometimes I think you know, people just think we, we sit around and make cool new technology. Well, we do, but there's a reason why why we do this. And, and we've been doing it for a while. In fact, we put the first quantum computer on the cloud in May of 2016. It was a five qubit machine. Um, hard to believe, but in just a little bit more than two months, we will celebrate five years of having a quantum computer on the cloud. Uh, in that time, over 300,000 people have registered, right? People have run over 740 billion hardware quantum circuits. I updated that today, by the way. I have to keep updating these numbers. And I want to emphasize hardware. The future of quantum computing is quantum hardware. Simulators are interesting. They're nice for debugging. They're nice for education, trying out small problems. But it's going to be the hardware that carries us to the new solutions of the future. Right. And so you should be learning and people are learning um, that one of the reasons why the 740 billion number, I have to keep changing it is because on a given day, people are running over 1.5 billion hardware circuits on our approximately 20 machines. Now, <laughs> that number, just to tell you, I updated the slide last week and that number last week was 1.4 billion. So just in the last week, usage per day has grown by 100 million circuits. Um, we're not on day one. We're not in day two. We're not in the second month. We're not in the second year. We will soon be entering the sixth year right, of, of quantum on the cloud. So, so with this as a setup, with this as saying, this is what we've been doing, this is what gives us confidence in looking out, as the title says, roughly five years into the future, saying, these are our plans. This is what we believe we can accomplish on this type of schedule. So it is not wishful thinking. It is not marketing. It is based on real experience for now, almost a decade, driven by real users. Okay. So, um, 
I, I, I did want to highlight a little bit these machines. This is something uh, relatively new, this page, but I, but I want to show you the type of information we give you. Um, when you use our quantum computers online, you can go either through the composer, which is a drag and drop. It's a very powerful type of environment, or you can use QuizKit, Python libraries uh, within Jupyter Notebooks on top of this. And you, we have at the moment 19 different systems online. Of these, roughly half of them are available at no charge. So the smaller ones, the five qubits, the 15 qubit Mel Melbourne machine. On any given day, um, those that 1.4 billion, um, it could be the no charge machines, roughly half of them, or it could be the premium machines, the larger machines. So for example, um, the um, IBM Montreal machine, um, we use the names of cities. These computers are not actually in those cities. We just, instead of calling it IBM Q X, Y, Z, four, seven, eight, we gave them names of cities. So there you go. Um, there's some person who's officially in charge of cities. I don't know. Yeah, in the organization. Uh, Montreal is the one that has the highest quantum volume of any of these. Um, eventually the other 27 qubit machines will have at least that high quantum volume as well. The Manhattan device is 65 qubits. So those premium partners in the IBM quantum network, they can use these. Um, I'm writing a new book and um, last week I used the 65 qubit machine just from home just using exactly the same sorts of things that you would use for the no charge types of software environment. I built a circuit, I queued it up and it ran on the 65 qubit machine and it's incredible, completely seamless. Um, you might expect a lot of people want to use it. <laughs> so I had to wait a little while. Um, and, and together with this, by the way, just in terms of openness and transparency, transparency the, the Montreal machine, uh, we give you all sorts of statistics. So you want to know really how these machines are doing, right? Um, this, I made this slide um, earlier today. Um, midday, it had been calibrated 26 minutes earlier. So these numbers were fresh as of today. So I think this is unparalleled access to understanding the exact state of real quantum machines that thousands of people are using to run billions of circuits. So again, as I go back to roadmaps and trust, you know, why do we think we can do anything? Well, we got to prove it to you. We got to show it to you. And, and this is why, um, if you are a certain type of developer as well, this information is very important to you. Um, and, but that's really a subject, subject of another talk. So this was the, um, the, the hardware roadmap, this was the, the bottom part of what I showed earlier. Uh, we announced in September and we highlighted the two machines we had at the time, the Falcon, and you saw some, some of those, the 27 qubit machines and the Hummingbird, which is 65 qubits. When we all first started talking about quantum computers, people were gaming the system by saying how many qubits they had. Oh, look at me, I'm wonderful. I have 37 qubits. Oh no, I'm slightly more wonderful. I have 39 qubits, what, whatever. But the problem was, is that a lot of times they were really bad qubits, right? Remember these are physical devices. And even if you're using things like photons or ions or whatever, you somehow need physically engineered devices to control and measure what's going on. So, environmental quantum noise enters into the system somehow, some way. Not to mention just the physical ways in which you, you talk to these, um, how well the gates work and, and things like this. So, you know, I remember saying three years ago, um, I don't care if you have 4,000 lousy qubits, if I have 50 great qubits, I win. <laughs> Cause you're not gonna be able to do anything of interest, right? And, and so we introduced um, a little bit more than two years ago, the, the notion of quantum volume as a measurement of the quality of it and something we were striving to do. And basically it's, it would say um, of, of part of a physical quantum device uh, of a given size would be working as well as you would possibly expect it to work, right? And so therefore you would want that number to get larger and larger 
uh, which meant that you had more control. Um, you could control the errors and so forth, at least on more and more over time of, of what was going on. Um, so Falcon represents with the 128 quantum volume, uh, a lot of the good work we have done to improve the quality. Hummingbird at 65 qubits is more directed saying, all right, but can we actually create quantum computers that have more qubits? Because they have to be good qubits, really good qubits, but you have to have enough of them to solve the problem that you want to solve, <laughs> right? On the other hand, having two <laughs> or five or six or seven really good qubits, you can't solve any useful problem whatsoever. It might say you're on a very interesting track, but having such a small number of qubits at the moment does, does, doesn't help you. So really, um, therefore, what we're saying is we felt, all right, we're now comfortable with scaling quantum volume, and we're now comfortable in scaling the number of qubits. And together, we therefore said, in 2021, now this year, we will break 100 qubits. Next year, over 400. The year after, over 1,000. And then through various techniques, we will scale and, and go larger than that. And each of these transitions is very interesting. And I will tell you, in the labs, the scientists, the engineers are, are doing things already for each of these devices, sometimes A, B, hardware tests to compare different technologies, um, all sorts of fascinating things, um, the physics of which I barely understand, if at all, I must say, I will admit. Um, but um, so all of this is underway, right? And all of this is based on past performance and what we continue to be able to do. This is the Hummingbird device. This is the 65 qubit chip. Um, it's about the size of a US penny, 65 qubits, right? Stunning, it comes in two pieces as, as, as you can see there. Um, it's a beautiful chip, um, very nice picture of a bird there. We have someone who specializes in birds drawings. So we really do. It's not his full-time job, but he, he does a nice job. Um, and then it will uh, continue onward. So going into later this year, um, these are some of the technical highlights, the, the, um, the, the, the physical and the engineering types of things. Um, the one I will mention um, and talk a lot more about in a few minutes is the real-time classical compute. But um, the third one here, multi-level wiring, just the way we actually build the chips to be able to control and speak to many, many qubits while simultaneously not swamping ourselves with noise. Because as we work on one qubit, potentially it could start producing noise that would damage the computations on nearby qubits. So there's a lot of physical technology that goes beyond that. When we go to 400 qubits by the end of next year, um, then we really have to solve the so-called cable problem. If you've seen some of the pictures of our devices, they have lots of these beautiful golden cables. And you would say, well, look, you're not gonna be able to eventually deal with hundreds or thousands of these. So the cryoflex cables here, it's pictured right in the middle. It's a, it's a band of, of cables that uh, we can multiplex through and control and read off many qubits. So that, that's something uh, we are doing. Um, to go above a thousand, um, one of the things we're going to have to do is lower the error rates. Um, you can see on this log chart that we've been able to do it um, at, at a constant rate. Uh, the Montreal device you saw, and, and we see no reason to think otherwise that we're going to do this. Now, something else is, is happening with this, which is um, we're not just talking about a single chip with all these qubits. We will be thinking about going from a single chip to multiple chips on what we will call a quantum motherboard. And eventually we will be stacking these, what are round quantum motherboards um, with a little distance between them, but one on top of another in what we call at the moment, the super fridge. I don't know why they call it that, but um, this is our CEO, Arvind Krishna, our senior vice president and head of research, Dario Gill. Uh, the super fridge is about five feet wide, is about 10 feet tall. Unlike the current dilution refrigerators, uh, you can see there are holes in the top and the bottom. We will be able to access them, uh, the electronics, the refrigeration from the top and the bottom. 
And here I want you to imagine stack like pizzas, multiple quantum motherboards, each of which have at least a thousand qubits and maybe more over time. And then as we fill these up and remember we're constantly miniaturizing, things are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, then we'll start connecting more of these over time. We'll start daisy chaining these in different ways. And, and there's some very nice early technology that we and other people have, have been looking at, at how to connect these. So, so this is the hardware where side. And this is, as I said, a little bit of a refresh. Um, these are the types of systems that will be in operation in 2023. But as you can see, we're already building one. We're building, we've been testing the refrigeration. Right, and all the aspects uh, well over two years before we'll actually have and make available such large quantum computers. All right, um, now let's get back to software. So um, I'm gonna give you three names for classes of software developers, and they're always different types. Um, through the years, uh, they've had different names. I mean, enterprise developers, now they're front-end developers, back-end developers. Um, sometimes it can be hard to, to keep track what is what. Um, what we will call here a kernel developer are the types of people who work very, very close to the hardware. So in your laptop, in your phone, in the supercomputers, at some point <laughs> there were people, um, and there still are a few people, who wrote code that more or less directly controlled the hardware. Right. When I was in college a long time ago, we wrote assembly language. Um, it was a learning experience. Uh, we quickly moved to higher level languages, but in that you could control the hardware. There's the same analogy with quantum computers as well. And so the goal is for these people is to create um, reusable quantum routines that are as fast as possible. The fastest gates, the fastest uh, small circuits that combine gates that, that do a certain amount of interesting function. So these are the, the experts and the tinkerers and the tuners and the optimizers who just will, as I said, get as much out of that, that hardware as possible. Now at the beginning with, with, with classical, um, um, the technologies, you, would th you could think of the number of developers as a triangle with the, the large flat base at the bottom, right? And so you would in fact have many, many people working down close to the hardware and fewer and fewer and fewer that could just call functions at the top to do applications. Over time that inverted so that most of the people in classical used higher level programming languages and there were fewer and fewer so-called kernel developers as well. The same thing will happen in quantum, but we're at a different stage. The difference is that we had about 50 years to do that in, in um, classical computing, and we're doing it in less than a decade, right, for, for quantum. And the reason why we could is because we learned a lot in those 50 years, 50 years plus actually at this, this point. Now above the kernel developers are the algorithm developers. So these are the people who build the slightly higher level reusable routines. So if you've ever um, taken uh, a class on quantum computing and you learned about things like Grover's Al Gro Grover search algorithm or, or oracles and things like this, these are those people, all right? They're gonna work at the gate level probably still, but they're higher level gates. They're not the gates that are implemented in core hardware, they're a higher level, but nevertheless, they want to implement these algorithms as efficiently as possible. They are reusable by many people, but they're up a step. And then above this are what we call the model developers. And this name model, um, admittedly, we didn't used to call them this uh, much in computer science and IT. We, we stole this name from AI because you think of a machine learning model, right? And what it encompasses with respect to the data and the operations. These people um, are, um, <laughs> are double experts. These are the people who know their discipline. So here I want you to think in the financial services, FinTech, 
I want you to think of the, the, what we would call, you know, the quants, the, the truly quantitative people. They are experts in their field, finance, or they could be experts in computational chemistry in, in different fields, but they also know the hardware. Frequently it's high performance computing hardware. So they know both, right? And they go back and forth. Same thing we are developing, and there are people who exist like this today. Um, many of those people in the IBM Quantum Network for the larger companies have these people. Many of them are the uh, former model developers who just work with classical problems. They're, they're extending what they know uh, to quantum as well. So um, where we're, we're heading on this, just to kind of return to this build, is um, we want to make available um, on the cloud, and here are the timing at, for these high level model services um, across a wide range of disciplines. And so these are the types of problems where I literally say, okay, this is my data. This is the type of problem it is, go to it. I said before, I don't care what machines you use. I don't care if this part's classical, that part's quantum, whatever, just do it, right? So they are tuned, they are services. You somehow pay for the service and they continue to be optimized. This is just a selection. Um, natural sciences is very general. We frequently talk about chemistry um, because of the relationships with quantum mechanics. Quantum computing is built, built on the quantum mechanics model, of course, as is chemistry and everything else in the natural sciences. So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, machine learning is an application, potential application for quantum because down deep machine learning and most of AI does a lot of math. So on one hand you say, can we do the math better with a quantum computer? Typically it's linear algebra, or can we use this completely different type of programming model with where we use things like superposition and entanglement and interference? Can we use this to get insights that are just not easy to get using classical techniques? So either, do what we're doing, but do it faster, or figure out brand new ways of seeing patterns or insights that we, we can't otherwise see. Maybe we can train better and things like this. Finance is here because while it is an early application area, um, it, it has a lot of fundamental algorithms, including optimization, simulation, um, that will be useful elsewhere. So don't just think it's gonna be finance and all the rest of the industries will be ignored. Um, I mentioned BP, ExxonMobil, I've already mentioned Daimler, well, that's chemistry. So people in lots of industries are looking uh, for the types of problems that quantum will be, be useful for. And these are the cloud services that, that will need to support that. Now, since 2016, we have been talking about circuits, and I'm, I'm sure many of you know what a quantum circuit is, but um, if you don't think of it as the basic unit of work, if I send something to a quantum computer and say, do this, the this is a quantum circuit. There it is. Um, if you look in many books on quantum computers, um, there's a lot of mathematics behind it, behind the gates, the operations that, that affect that. Um, and people have more or less known about circuits for, for decades, quantum circuits for decades, um, going back to the, the, certainly the 90s, but into the 80s as, as, as well. Um, but there are restrictions with quantum circuits because remember, fundamentally, we're not talking about a theoretical quantum computing textbook. We're talking about real computing with physical devices. So you needn't have this notion of complete purity of, of you know, a, a quantum gate is a unitary transformation, right? With these perfect properties and, and things like this. While that remains true, there's a lot of what we do in classical programming that if we can use together with quantum, Right, so enhance the programming model to be a true hybrid of classical and hybrid. We'll be able to do much more powerful things than somehow thinking they're two completely different objects. You know, you, one calls the other, which calls you know, and and that's it. You know, they're kind of separate. So 
the name of the game over software for software over the next five years is this bringing the best features for performance and efficiency of classical computing closer and closer and closer to the actual quantum computers. In this case, they're going to be on the cloud. Um, so as we think about this, you know, before I mention quantum volume as one of the ways of thinking about quality, we recommend people to now think in, in, in three ways. So one is quality. Yes, you need good qubits and you need good qubits represented within a system, which in total does um, increasingly better noise mitigation. And eventually we're on the roadmap to, to quantum error correction, things like this. Capacity. Well, you, you know, you have some quantum computers. How, how many circuits can you push through those? You know, we have 19 quantum computers on the cloud. Right away, that's the measure of capacity. We have a lot of quantum computers. You can run a lot of circuits. But the other way of looking at this is to saying, if I can figure out how to run the same circuit faster in a quantum system, right? Note the change of the word quantum computer to quantum system, right? If I can run circuits faster, I can run more of them. And therefore I have a much greater capacity of running many more circuits in a given amount of time. And that means for you <laughs> that you can run many more circuits as you are doing your quantum jobs. And that's extremely important because quantum fundamentally, the programming model is probabilistic at its core. And so you're going to need to run the, the, these quite a bit. And then variety. Variety gets to this notion of how sophisticated your actual algorithms can be. Um, are you tying your hands behind your back and having a purely quantum model? Or can we bring more of these classical operations to bear? So these are the three things. And I, I think that this is a very good framework, you know, again, whether you use our systems, any other systems, but it, it's a way of saying, are things improving? How are we measuring whether the world's getting better, <laughs> right? What are you looking at? So you can say, is capacity increasing? Can I write better quantum circuits, better quantum algorithms? Because the variety of techniques I can use to construct them is enlarging, right? That set of them is enlarging and things like this. So, so as you think about what happens over the next five or 10 or whatever years, you have to have a sense of being able to look at it and say, this is better than before. <laughs> but what is it? <laughs> and these are, are, are three ways you, you, you can look at this. Now, on the quality part, two years ago at the American Physical Society, uh, so in 2019, March of 2019, we announced that we expected to be able to double quantum volume every year. We did that on three data points. And so um, at the time, we and others talked about this as kind of a Moore's Law for quantum. Right, you know, the Moore's law, which says every 18 months to 24 months, we double the number of transistors, we have the energy, we, we, we have the so cut in half the, the size of the chips. Um, and we did that. And then last year we did it twice. So this is a log scale, right? But last year, in one year, we managed to double it for quantum volume to 64 and then to 128. So Roadmaps are cool <laughs> and you don't want to miss, but this is an indication that we're somewhat conservative because we've been able to do faster and you can look at how well these, these are improving. Um, and we anticipate, um, I, I believe we're still sticking to the once a year thing, um, just to be clear, but um, this is the type of thing which gives us more confidence in, in being able to predict the future a little bit more. Next up is the QuizKit runtime will be introduced this year. And I've already talked about a, a number of these concepts, but really the, the idea is to say, um, for example, me, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm in New York state. I have a desktop machine here. Um, I um, obviously I, I, I use programming tools. I, I use the web. Um, I can go online. 
I can use the Jupyter Notebooks with QuizKit. Uh, QuizKit is the open source software development library. Uh, it's been downloaded over 500,000 times, by the way. I mean, it's by far uh, the, the leading one. Um, but what's happening is that um, on my, in this case, on my desktop machine, um, when I run a certain application, it's all classical, right? And so I'm using Python in this case. And so I'm using Python loops, I'm using Python classes, I'm using assignments, I'm doing all the sorts of things, conditionals, all the sorts of things one does when coding. And so I'm doing a lot of things. And then every once in a while, I go over and I talk to a quantum computer on the cloud. And I come back. And, you know, if I'm just doing something fairly casual, that's okay. And I'm just, you know, every once in a while, I send it. But there are some applications, particularly in this age before we have quantum error correction, where you've got to send many, many uh, quantum circuits to the device. And then you start saying, where are the bottlenecks? Well, one major bottleneck is to keep talking back and forth across the cloud. I send over a result. I get it back, I say, oh, that's not quite right, or it's a little closer, I go back and forth and back. Yeah. And, and so I'm losing a tremendous amount of time just, just traversing the, the internet and, and going through the cloud and the queues and, and things like this. So we will start to introduce technology this year in what we're calling the near-time quantum compute, where we will push some of these classical operations closer and closer. So push them up on the cloud, push them past the queue and get them closer and closer to the quantum hardware. This particular slide shows my pushing all of them. Well, this year they're not all going to go, but we estimate that this will be a hundred times faster. So think about this. We believe now we can continue to scale quantum volume. And I showed you how we're done better than expected. We believe now we can scale the number of qubits, go from double digits to over 100 to over 400 to over 1,000 and beyond. And this is saying now we believe we can speed up the process by two orders of magnitude. So for us, this being much more efficient and much faster is the name of the game because we feel that we have good control over the things we need to scale. Everyone will have to get there. So as fascinating as any particular technology is, until they can prove that they can scale to more and more and more qubits, not just say they're going to, but do it. And we have to demonstrate this, right? You have to hold our feet to the fire, so to speak, <laughs> that we really do do this. But if, you're not, if they're not actually doing it, it's a marketing statement, it's not a technology statement. So just to show you one example without actually going into the, the exactly what it's doing, um, on the right-hand side um, is um, something which came from a 2017 paper we did, and it was on the cover of Nature, all right? Um, and on the left is a generalization of the type of processing that went on. And so these are the four loops, saying for so many points and this many mitigation schemes and this many optimization schemes, try this... Uh, types of representations for Hamiltonians. And by the way, because it's probabilistic, you have to do so many shots. For this paper, for this calculation that was ultimately shown in this graph, there were over 1 billion circuits that we had to run. Now we're lucky, we just have quantum computers down the hall, right? We don't actually have to go out to the cloud and across and things like that, right? Um, we're lucky we built them, but yeah, you know, and things like this. We estimate that if you had done this same thing on any of the clouds, including ours at the moment, it would take over 100 days of continuous processing. We believe we can get this down to less than a day by the end of the year. Right now, one other thing I just want to note I told you that half of our machines are no charge. What does 100 days of quantum computing cost you on the cloud that's charging you? Okay. So, <laughs> you know, this is one of the ways that we're encouraging research by giving open access to, to improving quantum computers. And then if you need more, talk to us. All right. So, so this is where QuizKit runtime, two orders of magnitude. 
Next up is dynamic circuits. Um, this is, if you're a coder, I'm, I'm gonna short, this is if then else, these are conditional statements. Um, most quantum computers, and, and some of them have started to sort of partially implement this, though they haven't always made use of it. The idea is you'd send a circuit across as I described before, it would run the circuit. It, you would measure the qubits, you'd get a lot of zeros and ones, you would send them back to, in this case, your laptop, and presumably those zeros and ones meant something to you, okay? You know, they're data, it's an integer, I don't know, it's doing something. And then you'd have to go and come back and go and come back and things like this. Um, we are now allowing something called mid-circuit measurement, where in the middle, you can pick a qubit, you can measure it, you can say, are you a zero or one? If you're a zero, well, now I'm going to send down these gates. If you're a one, now I'm going to send down these gates and so forth. This is very common in classical computer and not at all part of the quantum computer model. So this is an example of bringing in some of the classical constructs. This alone is going to significantly speed up what we can do. And you cannot do quantum error correction unless you implement this. So we're doing it but others will need to do it as well. That's just the way it is, right? Uh, for performance, but, but also what, what we do here. All right, now um, uh, just moving on and really kind of wrapping up this part. Um, uh, with dynamic circuits, we're gonna be able to create far more sophisticated and optimized circuit libraries. As we add more qubits, hundreds of qubits, uh, we're going to have more advanced control systems because, as I said, we might be going from chips to motherboards to multiple motherboards to multiple fridges and, and so forth. And also, you know, as, as we're pushing more and more of this classical computing closer and closer and closer to the quantum systems, you might want to say, what does integration with a high performance computing device look like? So it's one thing to do a little loop right, or a conditional or something like this. What does tight integration mean with high performance computers? And that's what we're thinking of probably about five years from now, where the rest, where it will be worth doing it. Certainly people will be investigating it, but it will be at that point that people will say, look, there's actual value to this. We're going to need this um, and, and understand what we're doing. Okay, above this, um, the algorithm developers will pop in. Um, they will continue to extend QuizKit. This is the part of QuizKit that uh, we've called Aqua. Last year, we introduced uh, some new modules in the natural sciences and in optimization. Um, it's, the, it's the third generation, in fact. So you're gonna see iteration of these libraries. If you're a software developer, maybe you should be creating these two, right? QuizKit is open source. Right. You know, you should be doing this. Once again, I want you to remember that these four are just examples. Yes, some of the interesting examples, but nevertheless, there are going to be other areas. Um, and this is the type of problem. Um, I mentioned ExxonMobil before the joint work we did with uh, routing of, of, of ships. It's a fusion uh, type of uh, so-called uh, Cubo solver. Uh, so classical solving with with some um, quantum optimizations. Uh, the paper, uh, which you can see in my LinkedIn from, from a couple of weeks ago, um, is about investigating different schemes of combining classical and quantum optimizations to solve single problems. What is the mathematics behind this and what you're trying to do? Um, how can you express optimization problems in common uh, description languages that people use today yet implement them in a combination of classical and quantum as well. So a lot, a lot of work going there. Um, chemistry, I mentioned, um, tremendous amount of work going on chemistry. Stay tuned on this. Um, you're you're, you're going to hear from us and from many people, constant, constant progress being made on chemistry. And it's, it's a very exciting area. Um, so filling this out, um, pre-built quantum runtimes, making things easier and easier to use uh, by the algorithm developers, uh, quantum runtimes plus HPC. And um, then on top of this will be the, quote, relatively easy to use <laughs> quantum model services, great place for, modern, for monetization, 
where will people make money, right? Well, you can produce cloud services that are powerful and built on quantum. You can charge money for them. So that's at least one of the places on this, right? Where, where you can think of doing it. Now we are about here. All right. Um, and actually I should probably, depending on wh where you put 2021, um, we, as I mentioned, we're doing a lot of work internally on the, on these future devices, um, but we will be marching forward as we go here. Um, just to summarize, um, going back to 2016, we've been on the cloud. Pro we've been prototyping quantum applications, this third generation of the Aqua libraries. We expect to get the two order of magnitude in increase this year. Dynamic circuits, dynamic circuits will be very exciting. It's gonna be a fundamental, very important way of, of writing code, of writing quantum code. It's going to open up all sorts of possibilities. And I think all sorts of creativity for algorithm developers. Frictionless development is a term we use to say, look, you know, developers don't always want to learn brand new things. They want to use the programming languages they use. They want to use the tools they use. So how easy is it for them to start incorporating quantum into their current tool chains and workflows? That's about 2023. 2024, these plus 1000 qubit machines will be common, right? Um, and at that point, we can make a serious investigation of error correction. Yes, many people, you know, there's the theory of error correction and people are saying, oh, we're gonna be so great, we'll be able to do this. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but you gotta have enough qubits to do these sort of things. And that's, wh that's where eventually we'll be. And then as I mentioned um, with, with HPC. Uh, one other way of looking at this um, on the left, maybe you wanna think of this as early adopters, use case exploration. Again, example, what we did with Exxon Mobil, um, uh, with uh, routing, what we do with Daimler on lithium batteries, um, so forth and so forth. We've had over 310 papers published using our systems. So people are examining the science underneath and how it will be used. And then going from a use case, which is a fairly high level to actual plugging into a workflow of how people actually will be using production systems, application development. But through all of this is skills building. You gotta learn this stuff if you wanna play. It's gonna be easier. You'll need to learn less <laughs> as time goes on because you'll be learning higher level things. But if you wanna get in, in earlier, you're gonna be kind of on the left here, a little bit more on the bottom here. You can live in the circuit land. You can live using some of the circuit, the QuizKit application modules in Python, right? But you gotta start developing the skills. I started coding when I was 15. I've had many decades of classical coding in my head. I tend to, well, at least before I started thinking about quantum, you know, have an idea of this is how you code. This is how you attack problems. And quantum completely changes that. If you were earlier in your career, if you were just learning coding, you learn classical and quantum coding at the same time. You won't have to go through what I had to go through, maybe some other people who are a little bit more you know, into their careers as well. So the three things here, um, QuizKit runtime this year, next year, dynamic circuits, and then these, these optimized QuizKit application modules that we will see for those initial four in other industries. I just wanna end with something a little fun here. Um, you may have seen this, um, this is called the chandelier. This is a model of, of uh, our 50 qubit machine. We have three of them. These days they don't go anywhere, right? Because um, we don't go anywhere, um, but it's very beautiful. And, um, you know, it's actually fairly standard. There, there are companies that make these. Now, of course, we have to actually implement the quantum devices, which are right down on the bottom in the center of the little rectangle. Um, but we do a fair amount of customization on, on these. Um, for those of you uh, who are fans of Philip Pullman, maybe have watched BBC or HBO, um, uh, you may have watched the show, His Dark Materials. Um, and um, lo and behold, um, 
Melora Wright, for those of you who made it into to season two, episode two, they had this scary computer called The Cave. And there it is. And boy, didn't they produce a, dim it, a, a digital image of what was a quantum computing cryostat chandelier. And in fact, it's ours. You can look closely at how, how they did it. So it's really kind of funny in this way. And, and you know, this is what I want to end with. It's that for many, many years, quantum computing was science fiction. And um, it was theory. And people said things, well, you know, if we ever have a quantum computer, then maybe we could do this. And now we're starting to get quantum computers and there's a long way to go and there's a lot of work to be done. So we've gone from science fiction to at least the beginnings of some very new and interesting technology to this new, strange, wonderful technology influencing science fiction yet again. So it, it, it's kind of odd to see in a very short number of years, um, such, such a development. Uh, so with that, thank, thank you very much. And I will stop talking and stop sharing. Thank you so much, um, Robert. That was an amazing talk. It was very detailed. And I think everyone has learned a lot. Um, I did see one question. Do you have time for questions? Yes, of course. Okay, so one question from Subor. He asked, how does the current semiconductor manufacturing issue affect quantum systems, if at all? So we make our own quantum chips. Um, it doesn't affect us at all because um, IBM long has made fabs, but in particular um, in Yorktown Heights, which is the IBM research headquarters, um, we have a whole back wing, which is a, a fab. So we have all the people in the bunny suits um, and we design our own chips and we can produce our own chips and that's what goes into the devices. So it hasn't affected us at all. Um, also regarding any of the other things, um, IBM is very good at supply chain. So we're not having any issues. It's great. So um, another question from Lissandro at 1.5 billion hardware circuits per day executed by 20 quantum computing computers. It means that each machine is executing 868 circuits per second. So um, they, asked to they asked to explain how that volume is handled by the quantum computers. How, I, I didn't hear the number of how many per second? Um, 868 circuits per second. Um, we run much more than that. We, we have the capacity to run at least 2,000 per second. Uh, we used to throttle them down to 1K, but we can run faster than that. So um, normally we, um, we used to, so we can control, <laughs> we can throttle, right? So we, we can physically control how many circuits get through. Um, now you would think you want to just open it wide up, right? Just, just run as many as you want. Um, there's a physical process, though, that's typically used at the beginning of a circuit before, which is to initialize all the qubits to zero. Since these are physical devices, if you just wait long enough, the energy levels drop to zero and they're all there. It's a way of cheating. We can now force this. We can actually force a reset. But um, so we would wait. I mean, I mean, this is the way it was. You know, basically, we we'd run a circuit and then we would. Uh, wait a, a few milliseconds and it would drop to zero and then we would do the next circuit. And then someone pointed out, oh yeah, we, uh, we can actually do more than that. So we doubled the speed. And I believe on some of the machines we can even do faster. So that, that's not a problem, they're, they're very fast. Sounds amazing. So um, I have another question I noticed from Chala. Um, they ask what are the ESD challenges to overcome in quantum chips? Um, I'm probably not the best one to, to answer that, to tell you the truth. So yeah. I'm, right. I'm not. Um, so another question from Abbas, how about hardware? Will you think about topological quantum computation in the following years? <sighs> topological is interesting. You know, topological, I mean, the theory has been around since the 1930s and, and it was hopeful, uh, you know, people hoped for a whole lot um, 
there, there was quite a bit of to do a few weeks ago um, about how some of the researchers, um, they did some weird things to their data. They, they, they cut off certain uh, outlying data points, which they claimed were simply for presentation purposes. But if you include those outlying data points, um, it completely disproved what they were trying to do. So it remains an interesting theory. Um, I have a colleague who um, got his PhD in topological qubits. He's probably, I would guess, 32 years old. He said to me that he hoped in his lifetime to see an actual working quant, you know, topological qubit. So. Sounds great. So um, Natalie asked that, oh, she says you mentioned that you're working on a new book. I think she's wondering to, if she could know more about it. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I, depending on how you count, I'm halfway or two thirds through. Um, what I'm trying to do in, in this book is it, it's a book that teaches Python. Okay, so, so just being, so the last book, Dancing with Qubits, was about the math behind quantum computing. And then I would take you through the basics of quantum computing because with that book, I found it was just very hard to get in one place everything you needed to know in an easily understandable way. Right? This book, what I'm trying to do is, and I kind of said a little bit of this in the talk was, what if I could teach you Python? So starting from basics, but what if I could teach you regular Python and quantum Python at the same time? What could if I could make qubits and circuits seem as natural to you as working with, with strings and other data types and developing new classes and things like that? So that's what this book is. Um, with luck, it'll be out sometime by the end of the summer or September. Um, I, I'm into the last maybe third of it, and that's always the grind. You have a lot of energy, and you're right, and you're right, and you're right, and then you sort of like, oh, what am I going to say? <laughs> you know, and things like this. And why did I sign up for this? But that's the that's the idea. Um, to so it's a it's a new book on learning Python with quantum fully uh, as fully as I reasonably can uh, incorporate from the beginning. Sounds great. Um... I wish you the best of luck. So <laughs> I, I'm going to need it for the next few months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jennifer asks, uh, you said you had to relearn programming. What are the core differences in how you program a classical versus quantum computer? So at, the, at their lowest level, um, classical computers use circuits, but they use what are called logical circuits. So they use bits, zeros and ones. And from these logical circuits, uh, things like, you know, ands and ors and things called XORs and NANDs and whatever, these are the building blocks of fundamental circuits that go into classical computing. From those, we can build up addition and multiplication, um, other operations that access memory and storage and interface with the operating system and so forth and things like this. Um, quantum computing, um, doesn't operate just on bits. It operates on something called quantum bits or qubits, which are very different animals. Um, and uh, whereas a bit can only have the value zero or one, effectively um, a qubit can have a state which is, you can think of as, as two dimensional. There's a lot more variation in, in what it can be. And we sometimes show this, for example, the surface of a sphere. Remember, a, a sphere or a ball, the whole thing sits in three dimensions, but just the outside of it is two dimensional. It's called the block sphere, you may see that. Um, and the mathematics of, of quantum computing is that as you start adding more qubits, the amount of information you can represent in the system doubles every single time. So you have one qubit, you have two pieces of information, two qubits, you have four, then eight, then 16. And so by the time you even just have 10 qubits, you can represent over a thousand pieces of information while it is working, right? And this is important. It's, it's not kind of just sitting there by itself. It's while the circuit is actually running. So you have a tremendous amount of um, 
of, of, of working room and the amount of information that you can construct and manipulate. Now, the model is not based on things like ants and ors and whatever. They're based on other quantum operations that come out of quantum mechanics, which is one of the strangest parts of science that there is. And many people like Einstein had major problems with it. Um, but it seems to be the way the world works at the very small. Um, and so uh, in the early 1980s, people like Richard Feynman and others, he, he wasn't alone, said, look, you know, these so-called digital or binary computers we have with the zeros and ones are terrible at doing things like chemistry, right? It's just, you know, we get these bad approximations and we use a ridiculous amount of memory. If you could build a quantum a, a computer that used the principles of quantum mechanics within its actual programming model, right? Then you could do chemistry and you could do chemistry in a computer instead of in a test tube or, or, or something like this. So that's what quantum computing really is. And it has these weird things like superposition and entanglement and whatever. So there's slightly different ideas. They take a little while to get used to. Um, but um, but it's, a, it, it's a beautiful, very elegant theory behind it, if you like that. Um, uh, but it does challenge your way of thinking if you spent a lot of time doing classical. For sure. I love the answer. So um, we have a few more questions, but I know this has already been an hour. Do you mm -hmm. think you can answer? I'm, I, I'm fine. It's nine o'clock here. I'm not going anywhere. So you know, <laughs> All right, for sure. anyone who wants to stay, I'm happy to. Sounds great. Thank you so much. So I have a qu another question in here from Su Fong Chen. Um, may I know whether students major in electronics, engineering, or computer science will have a better advantage in learning quantum computing? That is a question that if I would, the way I'll answer it in 2021 is different from the way I would have answered it two years ago and is different from the way I'll, we'll answer it two years from now. Quantum computing for the very longest time was, I would argue, 98% physicists. And then you'd have the occasional computer scientist and mathematician. Some very famous ones, but things like this. Um, we have been doing and others have been doing a tremendous amount of, of teaching and providing educational materials for quantum computing. So you're starting to see quantum computing showing up in computer science classes. You may not have complete classes yet about it, but you're starting to see it. And, and even in engineering classes, if you're talking about computer architecture, right? Well, it makes sense to start talking about quantum computing architecture. Um, right now, depending on where you were, are, um, I would say you probably want to do something like um, major in physics, minor in computer science, or the other way around, right? I know the question involved engineering, so maybe substitute the appropriate engineering for when I said physics. Um, I think I think there are going to be a lot of things that change in the quantum computing, programming languages, and models over the next decade. Um, one thing that personally drives me crazy is all these physics terms that enter into it. Um, things like, you know, interference. Well, where's interference? Well, it's two waves that are colliding. And what does that have to do with writing a program, right? So um, I, I think we have to computer science a lot more of quantum <laughs> computing language, right? And, and that'll happen naturally. Uh, but that's what I would recommend. And it, it depends a little bit how, you know, if you're a little bit younger, you know, if you're thinking, if, if you're in high school and you're thinking about it, maybe computer science plus physics. If you're a little bit older, maybe physics or engineering plus computer science is a slightly better answer. But that's the combination. Sounds great. So um, one more question from Aitakin. So what do you think about the programming frameworks like Ticket, which aims to standardize the programming environment that was presented last week? Oh, so last week we had a presentation from um, Mark Jackson. From, from Cambridge Quantum, yeah. yeah. Um, I think they're all very interesting. I, 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 I think um, it's, we, we need to experiment on, on these types of things. There are lots of areas and, and ways of, trying to understand what is the best approach to, to code these systems um, efficiently. Um, just, just expanding a, a little bit. 
um, <laughs> a lot of you are really spoiled in, in who are who are you know at the earlier parts of your career that you have a lot of programming language support that does things for you. Okay, um, I remember when C plus plus was invented. Okay, <laughs> you may be learned, but I I remember when it was invented, um, and. And what that also meant is that people had to create implementations of languages like C++. Python is turning 30 years old, <laughs> only 30, you know, well, what's, what's that problem? Some of you I, I, I know are with, you, with me on that. So there's been a, a tremendous amount of work going into like compilers and things uh, for, for classical programming languages. There's a lot of work that has to be done for compilers for quantum computers. And so there are a lot of startups, there are a lot of universities who are doing some very interesting research on, on that. So, um, so it's, all, it's all pretty fascinating, frankly. And you know, people will try things. Some of them will work better than others. You know, some, will, some will get traction. Um, we, we do hope um, that QuizKit being open source will truly encourage people to go out and play, experiment, and contribute you know, for that regard. I mean, that... That's the way to do it these days. Um, and I believe they, CQC recently made an announcement, right, about the availability of ticket, some of the things. So that's what we've got to do. We have to have as many of the smartest people in the world. You know, everything I showed you in the roadmap, just you know, throw a couple thousand smart, smart people on it and it'll happen a lot faster. So, including all of you. Sounds great. Um, on the topic of smart people, I have one question from um, a probably someone really smart who wants to get started into quantum computing. So Cindy Tran asked, for someone who is starting to get into quantum computing, what areas would you recommend starting at? So it depends on, 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 on where the person is starting from, right? Mm -hmm. And what they're interested in doing. Um, if you already know Python, then you can go, there's the online QuizKit textbook um, that's available. If you just look QuizKit textbook, it'll pop in a web search um, and you can work your way through that. Um, it's got live examples and it's a very good way of doing that. Um, if you're interested more in the math, um, my book and others can take you through that. Uh, different part of it. So, so, you know, kind of going back to the question about what should you major in? Well, what are you interested in, right? If you're a hardware person, well, you know, I got to find a hardware person who can answer that intelligently, but, uh, you know, but get, get started. The point is, is start coding. And um, I think, I think most people should learn Python. Let's put it this way. I think most people who are doing any sort of scientific or data science coding these days, you have very little excuse not to learn Python. Yeah, maybe there's R for some of those people, but, but learn Python and you're gonna be in a very good position to do many, many things in many disciplines, including quantum. Okay, great. Um, so we have one Oh, one nice comment from Chala. He says that your book on dancing of qubits is amazing. And uh, we have a question from uh, Satyam. Uh, what is the idea behind reversing time using quantum computers? Oh, I, I, truthfully, I don't remember that completely other than it was a major misunderstanding at the time, <laughs> right? It, it was just demonstrating some, but but no, it's not a little time machine, nor will it create a black hole. I want to hastily add. There's some follow-up discussions on it, but it was a it was a slight misinterpretation of the physics that was described in that paper. But we're really not reversing time in any practical way. So. Yeah, that would be another kind of break too. Um, so from Felix, he asked, uh, "What's your opinion on quantum machine learning, and how did they?" Can they expand and grow like um, expand and grow like classical machine learning? So, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I talked to that a little bit um, before when I was talking about quantum and AI, um, and so I think it's very interesting. Um, there are certainly um, some some ideas where. You know, a, the way I phrased it a little bit earlier in the talk was, can we do some of the linear algebra faster 
right? So that's mostly just do what you do, but do it faster. Um, or are there actually new techniques um, um, such as classification that you can do better, potentially more efficiently? Now, one of the things with machine learning is we don't apply machine learning to small problems because they're small. You can look at it. You don't have to have machine learning. Right? And so when you're talking about a lot of these things, you're, you're talking about thousands or millions of, you know, whatever you want to call them, rows or, or things like this. And your matrices representing you know, your feature space can, can get very large. Um, in this case, what, what, there are several things you try to do. So because of this, this growth that I was saying, every time you add a qubit, you double the amount of information. From a linear algebra perspective, you're actually doubling the dimension of the vector space. So you're trying to use the, the good exponential growth of quantum to control the unmanageable sometimes growth of your, your core feature space. But you need to have large enough quantum computers to do this and you have to have them with, as a term, good enough or even eventually fully fault tolerant qubits. So I think in the long run, it's very promising um, I, I, if I may make a slightly snarky comment, um, it is this, is that if you say you are doing quantum machine learning on the cloud, you get threat, credit for three buzzwords in one sentence. So, um, you know, throw in blockchain and Bitcoin too, you, get, you know, whatever. So be careful, right, is, is, is the point. Don't just get attracted to them because quantum sounds cool and machine learning sounds cool. So let's do two cool things, right? Um, look at it very critically when you do your research and, and answer for your own satisfaction is where is the problem really expected to add value and how large a quantum machine will we really need before we can practically see the difference? All right. So it's one thing if you're a university researcher, if you're writing a PhD thesis, because it's long-term research. As a practitioner, as a machine learning practitioner, it can be quite a few years before you'll ever actually really use a quantum computer right, to do anything related to your job. So it's interesting, very interesting. There's no question about that. But, but start with the, those key issues. Why are you doing it, right? Where will it save? What are the characteristics of the problems? And when will it truly be useful? Yeah, that's a really a great question um, answer actually, because like quantum machine learning, I see it everywhere. And it's, I've always wondered what like, everyone's doing with it. So. Yeah, and, uh, and I'm really not showing disrespect, but I, you know, I do. This, I, the computer industry has been through this many, many times of taking yeah. two, two cool things and sticking them together, right? This, this is a bona fide area. Yeah. Um, I, I will tell you this one other thing, which is interesting, is how can you use machine learning to make quantum better? Mm. So not quantum to do machine learning better, but the other way. So are there machine learning techniques that you can, for example, um, improve the overall accuracy of results coming from multiple experiments? And the answer is yes, we've shown that in chemistry already. So some of these advances, we will see machine learning and, and even more broadly, classical optimization techniques that we consider now part of AI will improve the results that we are mostly getting from quantum. Mm, sounds very cool. Um, so we have a question from Sebastian. Um, he asks, how far are we from solving Navier-Stokes equation or even more interesting competing with the traditional Haber-Bosch um, process for fertilizer and H3 synthesis? Interesting question. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. Um, you'd have to talk to a computational chemist. So. Mm. Right. Um, so another question from Alex, he has two questions. Hmm. Um, he asks, is there a plan for a pay-per-use model like the AWS, which gives more access to the hardware? hardware? And two, what are the primary challenges in some of the quantum algorithms, like Shaw's algorithm in Keyskit from having better results even on quantum simulator? And um, Alex, if you want to unmute and like, expand on your questions, you can do that as well. Hi, Alex. Hi, how are you doing? 
Okay. So yeah, my first question was around just uh, like a paper use model because you know either we have the free software, uh, free hardware, or we have the um, you know to get a special um, arrangement to actually use some hardware. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I was just uh, running some algorithms, and uh, there's a queue of seven thousand <laughs> in front of me <laughs> on some hardware. And on, um, on the, fi- the five qubits on the five qubit machines. On, the- uh, yeah, one of them is uh, one of them is five, uh, seven thousand, and okay. uh, so I mean I think the queues are getting you know larger and larger, and I'm just wondering if there's any plan to have something in between where you know one can have uh, like a paper use where you can get quicker access. We're we're thinking about that. It it's um. So, so just to be clear, uh, what Alex is saying, and by the way, Alex and I have spoken for probably two years on this topic. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> um, on, on one hand, we give you a lot of free access, but for the premium machines, you have to come in and um, you basically sign a contract with us for a certain length of time and you get a certain amount of access and things like this. Um, and, and the question is, you know, do we have enough capacity to do, open it up for a complete pay per, per use type of thing? We are thinking about that. There, there, there are a number of business considerations that come into that. How many people truly, really want to use those things? Um, will it actually be cheaper for at, at the moment for the, the heavy users? Because people, you know, there aren't people who want to run a thousand shots than out on a 27, you know, typically they're, they're going to be doing more than that. Um, so I think all, so all I can really say is we are thinking about that. We do understand the problem, but we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot in other ways by offering that prematurely. Okay. And okay. I was just looking at it. The, the 7,000 job queue is on the 15 qubit, but the others are at Oh, 3, on Melbourne. Oh yeah. yeah stay away Melbourne. from, stay away from Melbourne. Mel- Melbourne yeah. changed. Um, I'm actually on a queue of 23, but um, it's uh, taking 30 minutes. Okay, so, but, but we'll probably have, Melbourne. So, so here's the funny story with Melbourne. <laughs> Mel, Melbourne is one of the the oldest chips we've had, and I, I think it's probably 2017. Um, and for some reason, we did a whole lot of videos using Melbourne. And so a lot of people, when they start playing, they use Melbourne, even though it's by far not the best machine, but they just saw it in a video. And so they, they, they go to Melbourne, right? Um, and so we get these ridiculously high cues. Um, the other eights, um, uh, fives rather, um, that are there, we have been upgrading those to newer machines. Yep. Yep. So you note the quantum volume mm-hmm. is improving on those. Um, and we'll add more as capacity goes. So there's some other schemes um, to, to add more more, I'll call them machines. Um, there, there are other techniques you can do. You can actually split certain larger chips into smaller, you know, they look like virtual quantum machines, but you know, you're right. running multiple things. So, so I did have another question um, and I haven't been able to figure this out, but um, so you've written the book and you've got the Shores algorithm in there really well. So um, my question is, why is it that we can't factor more than 15 or 21 or uh, not 21, but you know, any of those smaller numbers um, from uh, Shor's algorithm using just the simulator? Because I'm assuming on the simulator, you can go further. Is it the, so maybe from your software and hardware stack, um, can you give an idea what is the limitation that's preventing us from doing better with that and you know maybe using the SDK why can't we get to a bigger number with Schwartz algorithm have you tried running it on the simulator we, we've got I, mean, I, I have tried running it on the simulator and it just seems to either run out of memory or it doesn't process or I don't know if it's even building the quantum Fourier transform at the back I just don't think it works <laughs> Okay, send, send me a note and I, I'll try to find out. I don't know the implementation in QuizKit of Shores, so I don't know where it would snag. Um, but I, I certainly could get an answer to you on, on sure. that particular I mean, question. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. in general, I don't think there's a lot of research with the Shores algorithm doing better than 
you know, maybe a few bits. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'd have to look, I mean, I offhand, I'd have to go back even to my own book um, and, <laughs> and, and sort of say, okay, for a number of this size with this many bits, you'd need this many qubits. So are you blowing the qubit count with the auxiliary, the, the ancillary qubits yeah. or something? All something right. Something like that, right? Um, okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay, but well, we'll figure it out for you. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, we've got a few more questions, but I understand it's already been 20 minutes past. Um, like, okay. Are, are, you, are you okay with that? Yeah, no, sure. Right. Sure. So, um, one. I, you know, I thank you for all for, you know, I can't tell how many of you are there, but, you know. <laughs> uh. <laughs> around like 40 people here right now, but they had up to 60 just now during your presentation. So, okay. I'll help you show that. Um, we've got one question from Vasil. He asks, is Will 2023 be the year when real businesses start to solve their real problems with quantum computing? No. <laughs> okay. No. Um, and, and, and the reason simply goes to um, the, the systems won't quite be large enough. It's, it's probably, you know, it's, so we, we have this term, which is quantum advantage. So we say quantum advantage, and, and that's the phrase we put on exactly what was described. So when will a quantum system do significantly better than a classical system by itself? Um, and so th there are various things that can read into the, yes, we are doing several things with these noisy machines, and you may see particular results here or there but by that time, they certainly won't be creating brand new materials and, and things like that. You're going to need um, thousands and thousands of qubits to start getting you know, into the practical place. And, and then you run into questions about um, uh, fault tolerance and, and the depths of the circuits, how many operations you can actually run and things like that. So the way we prefer to say it in a somewhat conservatory, uh, conservative way is in 2023, we can begin to make a run at quantum advantage and, and seriously start looking at quantum error correction. Um, so that's not when we will get quantum advantage and there will be interesting results before, but I don't think anybody will be in production with a, a universal quantum computer um, by that stage. All right, sounds great. Um... Another question from Ivan. I think you've touched on this a little bit. He asked, do you think that quantum blockchain is possible and is it something that can or should happen? Um, well, there are different, different ways. I, I, typically we get the question of, you know, when will quantum screw up Bitcoin, right? Um, <laughs> So let me answer, you know, not for a long time, not for a long time. So we, we, um, the, um, the, the various problems would just to answer that of, of how you would effectively break Bitcoin are on the same order of magnitude of how you do any sort of decryption, like for RSA and things like that. So you would need tens of millions of physical qubits to even make a run at that. Um, more generally, the whole question of quantum and encryption is that um, there's actually very little of it that's quantum computing <laughs> when it boils down to it, because it's, it, there's a cybersecurity question. So how confident are you that your current encryption schemes will withstand some sort of attack or frankly, carelessness? Right? Because a lot of times, I mean, when we have these security breaks, it's not because the system broke, it's because somebody did something stupid, right? Or somebody coded something stupid, right? Um, that, that's a major problem. There are um, being, and I know I'm answering a slightly different question. Um, um, NIST in the US, National Institute of, of Standards and Technology, standardizing what are called uh, post-quantum or quantum proof uh, encryption decryption schemes we encourage people to start moving to those. So in case quantum can ever break the current schemes, you wanna already be on track, right? To use the new schemes. But also the point being is that 
uh, the data you have today and encrypted today may still be very useful and should still be protected 34 or 40 years from now. So we may not, you know, if we ever get to the point of being able to use Shor's algorithm as Alex was talking about, right? Um, it could be, probably will be decades, but your insurance is shifting to new, new schemes. Now, going back to the quantum Bitcoin, quantum communication and things like this, um, I doubt there's a whole lot of urgency related to that versus just using, you know, the, these other better, better encryption schemes. Sounds great. Um, one question from Atikin. He asked if there are any plans for offering application-oriented algorithms within Keyscape, targeting numerical optimization such as genetic algorithms to solve problems of interest in engineering. Yes, within the optimization. So you should, um, it sounds like the person probably knows what we're doing there. Um, but yes, over that, that is one of the things over the next few years that, that we're, we're looking at. Mm. That's great. It's that part of the, the application modules. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. By, for the, by the way, I do, I do want to mention that blockchain and quantum, you, you get your double buzzword credit for that one too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question, Atikin. We have another from Abbas. He they ask. Um, they said you talked about capacity, and by that, do you mean the maximum rate of information processing without an error? And apparently, they're working on some aspects of this problem for their thesis, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it comes down to you know we we talked a little bit about the throttling. So. How many, how many circuits per second do we allow through the system, right? So that's a basic kind of chunking of, of what we do there. But um, yeah, how can, how can we actually just speed up the overall circuit? Um, there you also want to think about, you know, if you're doing a thesis on this with, with quantum circuits, um, you, you want to think about use of resources. So I mentioned mid-circuit measurement, uh, mid-circuit reset. Uh, this means that you can get greater use of ancillary qubits um, to do these sorts of things. This may mean that you can be much more efficient in, in the circuits you run, um, cutting back on the round tripping and different things. So there are many different factors. You know, and this is what I was saying about the variety of the types of circuits. Um, right now, um, in a classic quantum circuit, sometimes you use these extra qubits as you go along, right? They're just, think of them as scratch or work. These are called the ancilla qubits. They're just extra things, you know? So imagine you had a little scratch pad on the side, you know? So you're doing your work and then you just do this little calculation on the side. The problem is you can't reuse them because when you're done with them, they're just in some arbitrary state. Now, if you could reset them, if you could say, all right, set it to zero, now I can move it and start reusing it. Well, we, we provide that now. All of our systems provide that. So that means that we can use fewer qubit resources to do that. What does that mean in changing your effective algorithm to be faster? Because a lot of times there are trade-offs, the number of qubits versus the depth. If I can use more qubits, I may not need as many gates for the depth. So therefore I can run it faster and so forth and so forth. It's complicated. <laughs> you know, but the idea is that there are lots of lots of dials and, and things like this you might want to turn. Uh, but it's a very interesting question, uh, you know, as a thesis thing, which is fundamentally, how do you increase the throughput of quantum calculations and what are all the factors? Sounds great. Um, that's actually one of the, that's actually our last question. Um, so okay. if anyone else has any other questions, you can send it in. But other than that, Thank you so much for Mr. Robert Sutro for coming in today okay. and talking to us. We appreciate it. Thank you for it. the invitation. All right. No Thank you all. I see some familiar faces. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Good Thank night. You so much. Have a nice Bye -bye. day. Yeah.